Dever Houston, just like Snoopy the precocious pup that can do anything, you the dog crew have done it all. Good morning and congrats to Dogface and Underdog. They're on their way. Uh, we were enjoying a little well-deserved rest, particularly them, and so they're on their way to the microphone, but I beat them to it just a little bit. This is Mission Control Houston. This view is of uh, Northern Australia as uh, Endeavour continues uh, on a course now taking across the northern part of the continent just uh, inland from the north coast. Houston Endeavour. Again, uh, these views of uh, Northern Australia uh, Endeavour crossing the uh, Northern Territory. Of course, taking it uh, just inland a lot from the northern coast of the continent, inland uh, from the Gulf of uh, Carpentaria in Endeavor Australia. Info. We're getting some great uh, views of the land down under. Endeavour now moving uh, into the mountains along uh, the eastern coast of Australia, the Great Dividing Range. Well, we were just cogitating on how we might be able to achieve an opportunity to go chat with those people. Endeavour, I didn't know dogs could cogitate. We try not to do it where anybody can see us. This is Mission Control. This view from payload cameras, uh, payload bay cameras aboard the shuttle Endeavour showing the Spartan Science satellite sitting on its truss structure on the cargo bay. On the left side of the screen is the task board, a work site uh, upon which Jim Voss and Mike Gernhardt uh, spent several hours yesterday during their spacewalk uh, conducting a number of uh, tasks to uh, develop techniques and to prove out procedures which uh, are expected to be used in some assembly sequences for the International Space Station. Loud and clear, CNN. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Commander Walker, I'll get right with it uh, with you. Uh, a word about the complexity and the, um, the busy timeline which you had on this mission. I think before you left, you said you'd be happy if you completed 80% of your chores up in orbit. How close did you come to that figure? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't kept that close a track. We've been pretty busy. I think we've gotten most of the major objectives done, but the, the guys on the ground really have the, have the running tally much better than I do. Uh, I will say that I'm extremely proud of the work that the mission control team uh, has done in helping us stay with this timeline, and of my crew, of course, for, for hanging in there and keeping up with it. Uh, payload Commander uh, Colonel Voss, uh, let's have you weigh in on this for a moment. Uh, did you uh, at any point along this mission get the sense that uh, you're attempting to uh, do too much? Yeah, I think we knew that right from the start. Uh, we've known all along we had a full plate and we've been preparing for it knowing uh, that we were going to be extremely busy, hoping that we could accomplish everything that we'd set out to do, plus even some extra. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, any time that you have any difficulties or problems in a flight, it slows you down and could prevent you from uh, accomplishing all of your objectives, but I think that the ground team and the crew have both gone to extremes to make sure that we bring back as much science data as we possibly can. Of course, when there's a, a problem such as you had uh, with the Wake Shield facility, when you have a uh, tight timeline like you, you've had on this mission, uh, it just gives you um, less uh, of an you have fewer backstops, fewer options uh, to fall back on. Um, how, how much did that make the problem worse, let's say, with the Wake Shield facility having such a tight timeline? Well, every time we plan a flight, uh, we know that we're using a very valuable national asset, and we want to plan the timeline just as tightly as we possibly can to be able to accomplish everything that we can while we're up here. We don't want to waste any of our time. Uh, we go into it very optimistically. 
uh, assuming that everything's going to work properly. When it doesn't, we have a team on the ground every night, and their sole job is to replan for us during the day and make sure that we can still get in just as much of the science objectives as possible. And they send us up a new plan in the morning, and then we start to execute it. And through our training and their preparation, uh, we are well prepared to do that, and that's what we've done on this flight. Uh, I'm curious, how would you grade the performance of the Wake Shield facility? Uh, you were able to grow four thin films. Uh, you wanted to do seven. Uh, was that uh, good enough as far as you're concerned, uh, given the constraints of the mission and the uh, performance of the platform? Well, with an experimental uh, object like Wake Shield and a program that's in its infancy, which we hope is going to result in a, in a whole lot of... Uh, greater benefits later on, I think it's a mistake to try and grade it too harshly. It's kind of like a, a brand new kid in the block. You want to give it a few, uh, few tries before you start keeping score. I would say that Wake Shield definitely gets an A for effort. Uh, the people involved with it are tremendously dedicated. Our mission control team certainly gets an A for effort. When you don't know exactly what you're going to get, as you often don't in a science project of this type, it's inappropriate to try and give it a grade on product. I believe the fact that the wake has uh, been able to be characterized, that we've made this fairly complex manufacturing facility work, that it was controlled successfully and uh, interactively both from the shuttle and from the ground uh, despite numerous problems, uh, those were overcome. I think that speaks very well for the future of such facilities, both the Wake Shield itself and others of that type. I suppose uh, some of the uh, issues here might be a matter of expectations, uh, the fact that it, or a half full, half empty type of thing. Given the faster, better, cheaper approach which was used in, in building the Wake Shield with fewer redundancies than perhaps might have been used in the past, was, uh, was this what we should have expected as far as that mission went? Any time that you have an experimental program like this that's uh, making new steps in areas that we don't fully understand, we have to expect to go slowly. And the Wake Shield has done that. Their first flight, they did a lot of work on the arm. They weren't deployed. This flight, we deployed them. Their uh, control system worked very well. They had some problems, but they learned a tremendous amount. Next time they fly, we hope that things are going to go even more smoothly. Uh, we learn a lot every time that we fly a space shuttle, and the same thing is applied with the Wake Shield. Uh, every time they fly, they will learn a lot more, they'll do a lot better, and we hope that over time they will develop it into a, a commercial facility for uh, growing uh, semiconductors like this. Uh, you can't do it overnight, and until they've done it a few times, they don't know all the problems they have to overcome. I believe that they'll continue to progress right along, and like any experimental program, they'll get better as they do it more. With respect to better, faster, and cheaper, uh, your point, Miles, I think is is uh, is it worth it? Well, if you're going to go better, faster, and cheaper, you do buy into some risk. Uh, you do not have the same uh, redundancies and backups that you often have, and things occasionally will go wrong and can be expected to go wrong more often than they will if you've got the kind of program where we put all the bells and whistles into it. But you can't have it both ways. Uh, if we believe, as we believe, that you've got to conserve resources and take a little risk to mission success, uh, then you have to accept the consequences of occasionally having some things go wrong, and that goes with uh, this kind of a program. Would you call it a significant step down the road toward the commercialization of space? I think I would. Uh, remembering that commercialization of space comes in all different flavors, uh, if if Wake Shield were able to produce eventually, or facilities similar to Wake Shield were able to produce eventually the kind of semiconductor materials that were uh, impossible to produce on Earth or impractical to produce at any sort of reasonable cost, then I think you'd find people uh, singing its praises. To find that out, you've got to go ahead and take the first steps, and I think that's what we've done. And in that sense, I think it's very significant. Colonel Voss, a few words about the uh, EVA uh, yesterday. Uh, by all accounts, it appeared to be uh, quite a success. Uh, what were you able to prove about uh, the possibilities and the viabilities of actually doing construction work in space? We've done
done quite a few EVAs before that have demonstrated that we can work in space. We were doing some very specific tasks on our EVA related to the construction of space stations, some maintenance tasks and construction tasks. We had various tools, boxes that we changed out, and we used different methods for changing them out. I think that we showed that some of the methods that we have uh, could be the easier methods, such as free-floating for certain tasks, or some of the tools that we've been developing, the rigid tether and the body restraint tether, which are additional tools to help to control either devices or our own bodies while we're out there, are things that will help us to reduce the EVA time during the space station construction and make it an easier thing for us to do and make it a lot cheaper for us in the long run. So I think that we did prove that uh, a lot of the objectives that we were looking at uh, were feasible and uh, they will make it viable for us to do the construction of the space station. And just as a word of comfort, were you, uh, it sounded like you were pretty warm with the, the thermal improvements. Were you warm enough? Yes, neither Mike Gernhardt nor myself were cold any time during our EVA. Uh, one time I was when I deliberately turned my cooling to max cooling just to make sure that it would cool me, and in fact it did. And then I turned it back to warm again, and it warmed me right up. We had several things that were done to the suits this time. We have a, a device that bypasses our cooling completely, so we have less cooling than ever before in the suits. We had some new thermal undergarments. We had some new glove heaters that were intended to heat our, our hands up. On previous flights, people had reported uh, their hands getting very cold when they handled metal objects. And all of those worked extremely well. Even in the coldest attitude that we could have in the dark, uh, we were both very comfortable and had no problems at all. And when we brought the equipment back inside, even up to an hour after we had been back inside, some of the metal objects we touched were still extremely cold to the hand. So the suit is doing a wonderful job, and Glenn Lutz and all his folks there at the Johnson Space Center have done a wonderful job in uh, improving them. You must have been pleased to have such a successful uh, cap to the mission, both of you gentlemen. Uh, were you happy to see that EVA go as it did? Well, speaking as the commander, I certainly was. Uh, EVA is an important tool, and we need the opportunity to utilize it and practice it as much as possible to be ready to build station properly. But I felt kind of like a mother watching her kid go off to school. I couldn't walk them to the school, to the uh, school or to the bus stop, but I had to worry about them until they came back in. So I was uh, very happy to get those guys back inside. Colonel Voss, it was your. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add to that that, uh, of course, it was a wonderful experience for us, both Mike and myself. It was our first time out uh, in this hall. We're trying to gain experience for more uh, crew members also so that we'll have an experienced cadre when we start building the space station, and we certainly got that. We finished up the EVA, EVA a lot better than when we started it, and so we now have two more people who are ready to go and help to build space station. You had a few words about the view out there. Is it hard to concentrate on your work when uh, you're in those surroundings? Well, our EVA was very special with this, the thermal evaluations that we had. Normally people go outside, and like all our timelines, they're very uh, compact, and you stay so busy and you're focused on your work because you must be careful, work slowly, and really pay attention to what you're doing out there. A lot of times you don't have a chance to sit back and just enjoy the view. But because we were up on the arm for 45 minutes in an attitude where we were very cold uh, outside and we were not supposed to be active, we were supposed to have a very low metabolism, we had the opportunity to just sit up there and watch the world go by. Uh, I called it EVA heaven because it gave you the opportunity to be outside, have the most unobstructed view possible, and to see the world go by. And I don't know if you heard, but at one point I noticed that as I looked around, I could turn around and see 360 degrees all the way around me, and all I could see was water and clouds everywhere. It was just amazing to, to note that most of our world really is water, and I could see it all at the same time. Colonel Voss, uh, one more question for you, and this is on an entirely different subject, but uh, you were uh, lofted to orbit on some SRBs which were uh, modified because of concerns about the uh, gas pads, and I know you were involved in the uh, Challenger accident uh, investigation. I'm curious uh, how uh, pleased you are, I'm assuming you are, with the way the uh, process uh, went this time around, and what lessons has NASA learned perhaps from the Challenger accident? Well, I think we learned our lessons well from the Challenger accident. Uh, everyone listens when there are problems, and we go and fix them. 
Uh, the management listened when there were problems. We did not allow the shuttle to launch until we had fixed the SRBs this time. And I have the utmost confidence in our management team as well as the workers who prepare our vehicles. Something that my commander and good friend Dave Walker has said that uh, really struck home to me is that we live by the skills and talents of the people who work at the, the Kennedy Space Center and the other uh, places that prepare our hardware for flight. And that's the truth. And we all have complete confidence in their abilities to do that. I'm sure that the solid rocket boosters that we rode were the absolute best possible, safest ones that could be produced by human beings. And I felt that way when I got on them, and it proved to be the case. Uh, they were safe, and they did a good job for us. All right, gentlemen, we're just about out of time here. Thanks for uh, taking time out of your doggone busy schedule. And uh, I know dogs always like to come home. Uh, my dogs like to stick their heads out the window. I suggest you guys don't. This is Mission Control Houston. This view uh, from Payload Bay Cameras aboard Endeavour shows uh, astronaut Jim Newman moving the shuttle's mechanical arm. Uh, he is maneuvering it to the position where he will wind up cradling the arm uh, to put it to bed for the rest of this mission with its job done for the flight. This all taking place as Endeavour uh, tracks from northwest to southeast over the Atlantic Ocean on the 155th orbit of the mission. The robot arm was used uh, extensively during this mission to grapple, deploy, and retrieve the Spartan Science Satellite, which is coming into your field of view on the left, the gold-foiled satellite, which studied the uh, solar corona and the solar wind uh, for two days on its own. The robot arm also uh, grappled, deployed, and ultimately retrieved the wake shield facility, re-grappled the wake shield on uh, Friday to conduct uh, a series of tests uh, regarding the electrical uh, fields around the orbiter as it traveled through space, and then was used uh, yesterday uh, with a portable foot restraint attached to the end of the arm uh, to hoist astronauts Jim Voss and Mike Gernhardt about 30 feet above the payload bay and to uh, position them towards deep space to gather data on uh, the thermal effects of the cold of deep space and the thermal modifications made uh, to their spacesuits uh, to keep uh, spacewalkers in the future uh, quite warm as they work on uh, space station assembly tasks. The rest of uh, Newman's uh, colleagues are in the midst of a midday meal. The crew was awakened uh, over eight hours ago to begin its 11th day on orbit. Earlier this morning in the wee hours, uh, Commander Dave Walker and pilot Ken Cockrell uh, turned on one of the uh, shuttle's three auxiliary power units and conducted the uh, flight control system checkout. Uh, they uh, were able to exercise the uh, body flap, ailerons, rudder, and speed brake on the orbiter. It all checked out just fine and then uh, fired uh, many of the shuttle's jet thrusters, both primary and verniers, to uh, make sure that uh, all those uh, systems are available for the entry and landing of Endeavour tomorrow at the Kennedy Space Center. With that out of the way, the astronauts now have begun uh, the stowage of their crew cabin, the uh, deactivation of some of the secondary experiments in the mid-deck area. They are essentially packing up their ship uh, for the return trip. The crew will be uh, going to bed at uh, 2.09 p.m. Central Time this afternoon, about eight hours from now, uh, to call it a day and uh, to get up uh, late tonight, just after 10 p.m. Central Time, to begin their deorbit preparations, which will lead to their homecoming in Florida back at the Kennedy Space Center. Once again, this view uh, of the shuttle's robot arm built by Spar Industries of Toronto, Canada, as uh, astronaut Jim Newman uh, maneuvers it into place on its cradle along the uh, port longeron of the cargo bay.
The arm was first used on the second shuttle mission, STS-2, back in November of 1981 aboard the shuttle Columbia. Commander Joe Engel and pilot Dick Truly, who later went on to become NASA Administrator, maneuvered the robot arm during that mission. That flight only lasted two days, but uh, the middle day that the astronauts were on orbit uh, was uh, devoted almost exclusively to uh, tests with the robot arm, and it's been a staple item of most shuttle flights since then.